Hello, welcome to another episode of This, That, and the Other, and I want to discuss another, it's another football subject, as a matter of fact, another, another subject about the USFL, and like I said, I've talked about before, the USFL's talking about a, a possible comeback, and one of the teams are, they're considering bringing back is the Chicago Blitz, so we'll see, they, originally, the league came, when the league was formed in 1983, when it had its first season, in order to have a co television contract with ABC, they had to have teams in the markets of New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago, the three biggest markets in the country. And so, the first year, the Chicago Blitz was owned by Dr. Ted Dietrich. He was a cardiovascular surgeon that was from Arizona. And... He brought in George Allen as the head coach. Well, after 1983 season, the first owner in the USFL to, to sell a team was Jim Joseph of the Arizona Wranglers. And Dr. Dietrich, when he, when he found out the opportunity to be able to buy a team in the area, area where his medical practice was, took advantage and... He worked out a, comp, a very complex transaction where he talked Dr. James Hoffman, a Milwaukee heart, cardiovascular surgeon, into buying the Chicago Blitz, buying kind of a loose, I'm saying it kind of loosely because he really wasn't in any, any kind of financial situation to be able to own a football team to begin with. But anyway, Dr. Dietrich took most of the good players from Chicago to Arizona, and the bad ones in the Arizona Wranglers went to Chicago. One, the, 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 the man that was the starting quarterback on the Arizona Wranglers actually stayed in Arizona. Um, Alan Risher and was a backup to Greg Landry, who was who, who came over from Chicago. Also, to, and Greg Landry was an NFL veteran that that was he was a starter for the Arizona Wranglers the second year. Well, Doctor Doctor Hoffman. Almost immediately regretted purchasing the Blitz. He appeared to be in over his head financially from the very start, and it was rumored that Dr. Dietrich may covered Hoffman's down payment to ensure the deal went through. So Hoffman also, like I said, inherited the weak roster of the Arizona Wranglers in a complex transaction. He became the owner of the Blitz on September 30th, 1983. And he, he was only an owner of the team for a short period of time. I, I have not been able to find much much on him. His bio was, team issue bio was exaggerated. And he quickly fired several front office employees in an apparent cost-cutting move, generating lots of bad press. Before the team had even played a game, he relinquished control and had his to his um, other minor investors. He tried to find minor investors to buy into the team while he was owner, and he tried to sign. One of the things he tried to do was, was sign Walter Payton. That was that was a big big move he tried, but it, it didn't work. Walter Payton stayed with the Bears. And he hired Marv Levy, the old Kansas City and later on Buffalo Bills coach, to take that job. Marv Levy thought he was inheriting the, the, the Blitz players from, from the George Allen era. He didn't realize he was inheriting the awful Arizona Wrangler players. The Blitz brought in NFL veteran Vince Evans, who really didn't have that great of a record in the NFL. He had been a Chicago Bears quarterback for a while. 
and he quarterbacked the blitz that year. Well, the minority owners soon after relinquished control of the franchise to league and needing to maintain a team in Chicago, the USFL front office ran a team through the 1984 season. Hoffman thus had the distinction of being the only owner in the history of the USFL who never have actually seen his team take the field. Instead, the Blitz became the ward of the league for the entire 1984 season with all the other teams Owners responsible for the franchise expenses. Attendance, which had been weak in 1983 for a strong team, dropped down a, off the cliff, and the team had a 5 and 13 record. So the other owners had to put in money, put money into that team, and, and af, after I think when the team had like five games left, the USFL decided to fold the team. It did play out its season, but he, Dr. Hoffman, quit after the team had played two preseason games. He just he he was losing money right right and left, and I guess he decided you know this is this is too much for me. So he only owned the team from like September to I guess the time when the USFL started. Started, I, I, get, I believe it was March 1984, if I'm not mistaken. So it was late September. You got October, November, December, January. Let's see. October, November, December, January, February. It's only about five months. He was the owner of, the, of that football team. And because you know, I guess he learned learned a big lesson on that trying to trying to own a team, not have, not having the money to be able to do it. And after the 1984 season, Dr. Ted Dietrich became a minority owner of the Arizona team. It was it, it, the um, Arizona, the Oklahoma Outlaws and Arizona Wranglers merged, and became the Arizona. Outlaws and William Tatham, a senior and junior, were the owners of the Oklahoma franchise. They became the minority owners of the Arizona Wranglers, with Ted Dietrich being a silent, kind of a silent partner. They brought over Doug Williams from as a quarterback from Oklahoma Outlaws, and they brought in Frank Cush as a coach, an old Arizona State coach, and was later on Baltimore Colts coach in the NFL. And that's what I was able to find out on this short-time owner of the Chicago Blitz. There was talk about another team emerging in Chicago, but after the 1986 season, but there never was an 86 season. After, after that lawsuit, they won and only were awarded $1 for, for damages. And... They sued the NFL for having a monopoly, which they won the suit and were only awarded a dollar for it. Matter of fact, I heard that check was never cashed. It's, I heard it's in the Pro Football Hall of Fame framed right now. That's what, what that's what I've heard. I've never actually been there, but that's what I've been told. And with that being said, I'm looking for more ideas on what to do shows on. Anything historical, if it's feasible, I'll research it and come up with a show on it and as always like subscribe share thanks for watching